How would you like to be considered a part of the nobility? You know, those people who supposedly have those noble characteristics or those characteristics that are notable in life. That's what we're talking about today here on The Passage. So go ahead and stay tuned. Hey folks, welcome back to Passage again. My name is Jim Merle, and yes, like always, I'm going to do my very best to take a passage of Scripture and apply it to your life in such a way as to prepare you so you can make a passage to heaven. Yeah, I know that's a little cheesy, but nonetheless, okay, we're studying the Bible here. That's what we plan to do. But today, particularly, we're talking about this subject of nobility and what it means to be noble, how we can fulfill that, how we can acquire that and achieve that, all sorts of things like that. But I think for this discussion, we should really boil it down and start with the very beginning and talk about the nobility as far as its appearance. When you talk about someone or when you're told about someone who is of nobility or noble, what do we really mean by that? Well, according to Webster's Dictionary, basically nobility can be defined as having belonged to a hereditary class with a high social or political status, maybe an aristocrat. A secondary definition comes around, which I think we really understand a little better, and says having or showing a fine personal quality, high moral principles or ideals. Some synonyms for the same word go as this, being righteous, virtuous, good, honorable, honest, or upright. Well, from that perspective, putting aside physical nobility as far as, you know, what someone may possess if they're a king or queen or prince or princess, in a sense, I think those characteristics should describe us as Christians. So when you think about the appearance of nobility, what the world thinks, basically I think these definitions and these synonyms have shown such, but what about actuality? What about nobility could actually be seen and should be seen in our lives? That is better stated what do we know about it? Well, I think that's where we get directly to today's text. And I hope that you have your Bibles, whether it be a printed copy like I have with me here, maybe a digital copy on your phone or your tablet or wherever you can find that, or maybe you're driving or exercising or working or whatever, and you can't get to one. Just promise me you'll check it out a little bit later today. How about that? Okay. But I've got my physical copy of the Bible in front of me, and I'm going to be reading to you from John chapter 4, beginning in about number verse 46. So John chapter 4, verse 46. Here's what the Bible says. Now listen to this man, to his characteristics and what he is called. Here it is. So Jesus came into the cane of Galilee, where he made water to wine. Now, that was the first miracle of Jesus. And there was a certain nobleman, a noble man. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come into Judah, into Galilee, he went into him and he sought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Verse 48 adds, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. In other words, if you don't get down here, he's not going to make it. Verse 50. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word of Jesus, and it was spoken unto him, and he went his way. And when he was now going down, the servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And then he inquired of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew, notice this, the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus saith unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. So let's just look at the context here, talk about it a little bit, and then I promise you we need to really connect this to some even more important scriptures. There's no such thing as more important, but some um, equally important scriptures toward the end of this. First thing I want you to notice about this, nobility and actuality, that is how it's expressed, how it really looks to us and what we know about it. This man had, number one, he had a situation now. And the situation was that his son was extremely sick under the point that he assumed without help, 
he was going to die. Now, what he knew about Jesus at this point, we, we don't really know for sure. We can assume that in the early days of Jesus' earthly ministry, that is, when he was walking around, starting to teach, do miracles, that sort of thing, his information would have been somewhat limited, but it's possible and very likely that he knew about, as stated here in the text, that he knew, like others would, about the miracle Jesus had been performing or had performed over in Cana of Galilee. So Jesus comes back in the area around Capernaum. Now this man approaches him and says, you know, my son is sick. If you don't do anything, if you can't come down and heal him, he's going to die. So he had a situation. But the problem with this man's situation was not just that his son was dying. It was according to Jesus' own words, he had a shortfall. And the shortfall, just to read that statement again, Jesus told him, verse 48, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. What Jesus is encouraging him to do here is to have a faith, a trust, a belief, a reliance, the ability to lean on him as the very son of God and God in the body without having to see a miracle. Now, you can certainly think about that and really look at all the perspectives of it a little better and think to yourself, well, if I was that father, whether or not it built my faith or not, I would still want my son to be healed. And I assume that's true. But nonetheless, Jesus wanted to stop this man in his mindset in the moment and make an example of what was happening. And Jesus' specific thing that he said was, unless you see or accept you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. Now, that situation that led to his shortfall being revealed also led to his sincerity, okay? Keep that in mind because we kept reading there and it said that the nobleman told him or asked him to come down, verse 49. Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And then it's interesting to me, once Jesus says that, it's recorded in verse 50, in 51, 52, whatever, we see no other discussion by this nobleman. We don't see a man who's standing back in arguing with Jesus and saying, look, man, I don't care what you say. My son is sick. My son's going to die. And I've heard that you are the only one that can heal him. And you need to get to the house. You need to come on. You need to pack your bags. We need to get on the road. We got to get there. He didn't say that. Apparently what happened is when Jesus saw this in him, that is his shortfall, among his situation, this man's sincerity kicked in. This man, without question, turned back immediately and started heading home. And of course, as we read, as he headed home, as he started that way, thankfully for his comfort at least, his servants met him on the way. So before he even made it all the way back, and we don't know exactly you know, exactly where he was. Some have estimated maybe he was a two-day or more journey away. Don't know that. Didn't take time to research it right now. But nonetheless, he had a ways to go. And the servants met him, and they gave him satisfaction. And so this man's nobility, what we know about it in actuality is he had a situation, he had a shortfall, he had sincerity, which ultimately led to his satisfaction because he gets back home, and once he gets back home, he finds his son there, and his son is fine. And according to the servants, when they ask or when he asked or inquired of them, you know, when was he healed? Maybe trying to uh, blow it off, maybe trying to say, well, you know, Jesus said he was healed yesterday and he didn't feel better till today. And I don't know what his intentions were. Or maybe, you know, maybe he felt better before I even got on the road good and he's been well for days. Don't know the situation. But I know this, they, they stated to him he was healed at this, that this hour, and that man knew through his sincerity and now his satisfaction that was the hour. So we have a man, and this is why I went to the whole text, John chapter 4, verses 46 to 53. We have a man who here who is specifically described as a nobleman. What does that mean? Well, in his day, it probably meant, as we read above in the appearance of it or the definitions, it probably meant that he had a, her a hereditary class of high social and political status. It probably meant that to an extent, he possessed some fine qualities and high moral principles and ideals. It could have meant that to man's uh, view of things, at least, that he was righteous, that he was virtuous, that he was a good man, honorable, upright, and honest. Again, all good characteristics. But you see, if they saw any of that in him, that was no proof at that point 
as to his spiritual condition, as to his spiritual nobility, as to whether or not he could be considered a noble man in spiritual things. But you see, once this is all done, and as we read the whole of the story and got to the bottom, verse 53 told us specifically that so the father knew it was at that same hour and in which Jesus had healed him and said, thy son liveth. And because of that, he himself believed and his whole house. So we got a man whose faith here is a little faulty, whose faith here is being questioned by Jesus, whose faith here is being stated as a sign-seeking faith, a, fa- a faith that can only be you know, proven or can only be uh, it grown or advanced because he saw a miracle with his own eyes. He didn't get that opportunity. Now, he sees the results of a miracle, and certainly that connection back to Jesus and the discussion from the days before made a difference. But it wasn't until he gets back and he confirms with all satisfaction what he has seen that his faith then now begins to blossom and develop. What actually happened to this man? Let's think about it. This man was a nobleman now, not just physically, but became a nobleman spiritually because of what he did. So when you think about nobility and its appearance, it could be just a surface thing like Webster's Dictionary. When you think about nobility and its actuality, this account, John chapter 4, verses 43 uh, through 53, or 46 to 53, that specifically gives us an example that we can look at and say, okay, that's nobility, and that's nobility and it, and it and its growth. That's nobility going from the physical over to the spiritual, and that's what matters. But how is that achieved? How is nobility achieved? What is the achievement of nobility? Well, I think this is where we need to go to a couple of other scriptures. I promise you will be quick, and they'll be short. But I want to take you over to a couple of other scriptures to understand the term noble or to understand what it means to be a noble man or of nobility in a spiritual sense. And so take those same Bibles, you've got them, turn with me now for over from the book of John, turn to the right a little bit, go to the book of Acts. When you get there, go to Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, that's Acts 17 and verse 11, and just read these couple of verses along with me. First, Acts 17 and verse 11, this statement is being made, and these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received a word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, you really got to read context of this. That's Acts 17, verse 11. You got to read back to verse 10 to find out that this basically were the Bereans, but not just the Bereans in general, the Bereans in general who happen to be Jews, who happen to be worshiping in the synagogue. And at that day and at that time, just because someone was a Jew by birth did not mean that they was actually a part of the Christian faith, did not mean that they had actually been converted, but it did mean that they were religious, and it did mean that they were, you know, still considered themselves a part of God's people. In the case of these people, they were going to the synagogue, whether they were doing it properly or not, we cannot tell, but they were going into the synagogue originally to continue their Old Testament worship, to continue to to give honor and glory to God the Father through their study and understanding of the Old Testament. But they're commended right here because it says, again, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So what we have is Paul traveling around. Paul's meeting different groups of people as he moved from one city to the next to the next. Maybe he took note of a good group of people in Thessalonica, an honorable people in Thessalonica. But then he gets here in Berea. And he meets this group of people in and around this synagogue, and he says these people are more noble than those. How could you be more noble? Well, he says it right here. Through inspiration, through God's breath and the pen of of another man, in reference to Paul and his journeys, Luke writes these were more noble in Thessalonica 
in the fact that they received the word with readiness of mind. What that means is when they heard the word of God preached, they put aside all their preconceptions, they put aside all their traditions, all their ideas, and they just grabbed the word of God, if you will, in their hearts and said, look, this is what it is. This is the word of God. This is what we must do. This is what we must know. And, and they began to use that, I guess, in their lives. And he says the way they accomplished that was that they searched. Now, the word search doesn't mean a thumb through. The word search doesn't mean plop a Bible, you know, in our case, plop a Bible open and read the verse of the day and say, ah, that's pretty good. That's, that's, that's it's encouraging scripture. It's not that. Searching means to dig into, to, to see, but not just to see with a, with a distance of eyes, but to gaze and, and to dig into something, to appreciate it. And it says they search the scriptures. How often did they do it? They search the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. So if we go no farther, and we're not even back to our original idea of nobility, but if we go no farther, these people were called noble. Why? Because they opened their hearts to the Word of God. These people were no more noble. Why? Because they searched out the Word of God. These people were more noble. Why? Because they did that with regularity. They did that every day. So if I stand back and I want to be a part of the spiritually noble, I want to be a part of spiritual nobility, I'm not going to be able to accomplish that if, you know, I pull out a Bible uh, once a week when we arrive at worship, you know, get to church, or if, you know, I grab the Bible off the coffee table every now and then just to see a verse that I happen to remember or think about, or even if I become a daily Bible reader, but I do it from the perspective of, you know, let me grab my chart and see what I got to read today and rush through it and move on. Well, I, you're not going to get to the bottom of things that way. You're not going to become noble that way. At least I've not been able to accomplish it, and I don't think the Bible teaches that we can they searched the scriptures daily. Why did they search them out? To see whether these things were so. Folks, they had men like Paul and others that were traveling in and out of their cities that were proclaiming what they called probably the word of God, what they called, you know, the scriptures or what have you. And these men were going and checking that out. They were saying, okay, and I'm just using terms we would understand. Brother so-and-so uh, said the other day this and such was true. And instead of just saying brother so-and-so is always right because he's a good man and he's been our preacher for, you know, 26 years and three months and four days, they didn't do that. They said, I don't care who it is, what he's preaching, how he's preaching, how impressed I might be with such, I'm going to dig in here myself. I'm going to search this out. And that's what made them noble. Now, one of the verse to confirm with you that getting to a level of spiritual nobility can only be accomplished by digging into the word, searching out the word, and then ultimately using it in our lives is a very familiar text to us as well. It's Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans 10 and verse 17 simply says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if these men, women, whomever was involved back in Berea were called noblemen because they dug into the word of God, they searched those scriptures to see whether those things were so. They did that, and through doing that, their faith was built. This is basically a mathematical equation, okay? Basically, this is a mathematical equation. And and I don't, I'm not good at math. As a matter of fact, every one of my children, except for maybe my daughter in pre-K, four-year-old pre-K, have already passed me in mathematical abilities in their studies. And so I, you know, it's just one of those subjects I can't help a lot with, but it's basically like a mathematical, I almost said algebra, is it algebraic, anyway, an equation that has an X in it. And it's almost like what it says is X equals the word plus hearing. Maybe, maybe you should say X equals hearing plus the word. So writing that somewhat backwards. And then the answer is that the word and the hearing of it brings on faith. Now go all the way back in your minds to where we started with this noble man from John chapter 4. What did he have to gain? He had to gain more faith. 
How did he gain? How did he grow? How did he build that faith? He grew that faith and built that faith by hearing the words of Jesus. When Jesus said, go thy way, thy son liveth, no question, no comment, no discussion, not a matter of obligation, not a matter of mere suggestion, but a matter of the fact that he struck it out and he hit the road to go home. With trust, reliance, belief, and faith, the what he would find there on the other side will be a positive note. And when he did find that, his faith was not only his faith, but his faith ultimately, through his example, became the faith of others, of his whole household. So look at the impact. So do I want to be a nobleman? Yes. I don't want to be a part of a monarchy across the seas or anywhere else. I don't want to be called king or queen or prince or princess. I probably couldn't do the queen or princess thing anyway, but I don't want to be a part of that. That arist, arist, how do you say it? Aristocracy? I don't know. See, I don't even know English, but I love my Bible. I don't want to be a part of all that. But when it comes to spiritual nobility, I want to be a part of that, but I want to do it properly. Now, with that being said, I don't want to leave this because someone will comment below, and I welcome your comments, by the way. Please comment below. Help me learn. Help me examine text. Help us all to grow together. Help us to make that passage from the Scriptures, passages, to passage into heaven. But there's also a caution right here. An understanding that not all who are called noble are actually noble as far as in God's eyes. Now, again, I'm trying to compare the physical nobility with the spiritual nobility, but in 1 Corinthians 1, mark this down, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26, here's what the Bible says. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men of the flesh, not many mighty, not many notable or noble are called. So Jesus says, you know, out of those who are going to be called into judgment and called to be faithful and brought inside of heaven's gates, it's kind of the whole picture, sometimes the noble ain't going to make it. Not many of them will. But he goes on to add, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound, uh, to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of this world, verse 28. That which are despised, and God has chosen ye all things which are not to bring naught the things that are, for no flesh should glory in his presence. What, what are you saying there, Paul? What has God inspired you to write? He's saying, look, don't glory in your presence. Don't walk around and strut and, I would say, pop your proverbial suspenders and brag about your nobility and your ability to be noble and how wise and important. Don't do that. Don't do that. People in those categories of nobility, not many will be called. But a spiritual centered man, a man who's centered on the scriptures and the word of God, he can do it. Just like this nobleman over in John 4, he accomplished such, he did such, he built his faith, he grew his faith, or it was grown in him. He got to a place where he could really be that nobleman for the first time. And through the pattern that we found in Romans 10:17 through the ideas that we noted in Acts 17 and verse 11, you can become noble by searching the scriptures whether these things are so. Folks, I hope I've helped you do that today. I really appreciate your attention. I appreciate you viewing the program. I hope you'll come back another day as we sit down and discuss a small portion of God's word. Stay faithful, my friends. <music>